So in this segment, I want to talk about the apparent paradox or conundrum of slip on low angle normal sense detachment faults. And to start by just giving you an, an intuitive sense of why this is such a problem, and then after that we'll launch into the quantitative aspects of it, here's the orientation of the Whipple detachment. It's very shallow, even horizontal, uh, in the center of the range. And you may recall from structural geology that in an extensional regime, the maximum pr principal stress, sigma 1, is vertical, and the minimum principal stress, sigma 3, is horizontal. And so the paradox lies in the fact that if you apply a vertical principal stress on a fault that is very shallowly dipping, and then you resolve that principal stress into its normal and shear components, you end up with very high normal stresses, which are the component of stress that really clamps down on the fault and prevents slip. And you end up with very tiny shear stresses, which is the component of the stresses that actually promote slip. But in this case, it's so small that it creates conditions that make it very difficult for slip to occur. So this is the fundamental issue. And now we're going to go through the theory on this in more detail, um, hopefully conjuring up some of the concepts you remember from structural geology. So let's talk first about the ideal or typical angle that normal faults should have. To figure this out, we want to consider the Coulomb criterion for shear failure, which is an empirical relationship that tells us at what shear stresses tau, an intact rock, will form uh, a fault as a function of uh, the rock's cohesive strength, C, its coefficient of internal friction, ui, and the effective normal stress, which is a function of the applied normal stress minus the pore fluid pressure. This is, of course, the equation of a line that will look like this with shear stress on the y-axis and effective normal stress on the x-axis. The slope of this line is mu i, which experiments indicate ranges from about 0.5 uh, to 1 for nearly all rock types, and the y-intercept is uh, the, co the cohesion. So recalling again that in the case of normal faults, the maximum principal stress is vertical. This means that the maximum principal stress is equal to rho times g times h, where rho is the rock density, g is the acceleration of gravity, and h is the thickness of the rock column. So this is just the weight of the overburden that sigma 1 is equal to. So if we want to know the ideal angle at which faults should form in this regime, we will simply draw a circle that intersects the Coulomb failure curve tangentially. And where the circle intersects the x-axis again will be uh, the magnitude of sigma 1. So the diameter of the circle is sigma 1 minus sigma 3, known as the differential stress. Now we can draw a line from the center of the circle to the tangential point between the circle and the Coulomb failure envelope. And this gives us the two theta angle, which is 120 degrees in this case. And then to convert that to a fault dip, we note that the theta is the angle between the pole to the fault plane and sigma one. And so this ultimately yields ideal normal fault dips on the order of 55 to 65 degrees. We normally just assume sort of 60 degrees is a typical fault dip um, based on Coulomb theory. So what this means is that in the case of breaking intact rock to form new faults in an extensional regime, those faults should always be around 60 degrees and definitely not even close to the 10 to 20 degrees uh, that we see in most core complexes. Okay, but now let's think about the possibility of reactivating existing misoriented faults. We know that many extensional regimes have had an earlier tectonic history, perhaps dominated by thrust faults. So maybe these normal faults are pre-existing weaknesses that become reactivated once extension initiates. So to examine this possibility, we're gonna use a different friction law known as Byerly's law for sliding on pre-existing faults. This is a similar relationship to Coulomb failure, but now there's no cohesion. And rather than using the coefficient of internal friction, we're using mu, the coefficient of sliding friction. 
This is called Byerly's law, but it's actually an empirical relationship, not a law, but it's so easily reproduced in the lab that it's considered very uh, robust. And basically what Byerly did was he collected up as many different pre-faulted rock types as he could and systematically measured the shear stress at which they fail under different normal stresses in the lab. And he found that with few exceptions, they all follow this relationship where mu is uh, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8, so fairly high coefficient of friction. If we plot that here schematically, we find Byerly's law is the blue curve. It passes through the origin because of the lack of cohesive strength. And the Coulomb curve is the green one. And so this, of course, shows that pre-fractured rocks are generally weaker than unfractured rocks. And so then if we do the same exercise we did before of examining what the two theta angle should be for pre-fractured rocks in an extensional regime, we come up with a two theta angle of 115 degrees. This translates to a fault dip of around 58 degrees. So it's not really much different from uh, the Coulomb case. So now you might wonder, what if we just start increasing the pore fluid pressure? This has the effect you might recall of pushing Moore's circle to the left because this decreases the effective normal stress. In doing this, we can arrive at a reactivation angle of pre-existing fault dips that are shallower and shallower. So here I'm showing pushing the circle to the left and now you can reactivate faults at 50 degrees, push it further to the left and we can reactivate faults at 40 degrees. But if we try to reactivate slip on faults shallower than 40 degrees, we have a problem because soon enough we again intersect the Coulomb failure curve, which means that the rock body should develop a new optimally oriented fault before it reactivates slip on existing poorly oriented faults that dip less than 40 degrees. So to summarize that point then, our, our theory generally indicates that extensional slip can only reactivate faults with dips greater or equal to about 40 degrees. So we can't use this theory to very effectively explain how we get extensional slip on these very low angle structures. And so this is what's known as the detachment fault par paradox and it's led to lots of disagreements and uh, discussion in the tectonics literature. There are some potential explanations for this paradox, paradox and I'll just note a couple of the leading ones uh, now. One faction of researchers actually leans toward the idea that low angle normal faults in fact do not exist. So researchers in this category typically support the rolling hinge model of core complex development, which suggests that the detachments only slip at high angle orientations and slip shuts off at low angles. Other workers have suggested that perhaps low angle normal faults in particular do not follow Byerly's law, uh, but instead are occupied by weaker, maybe more exotic minerals with lower friction coefficients. Regarding the hypothesis that low angle normal faults simply don't exist, there's quite a bit of debate on this issue um, and there's different ways that people have um, tried to address it. If we return to the Whipple fault again, there's actually geological evidence that some of the slip on the Whipple fault was accumulated at quite low angles and at the surface. So for example, there's a prominent landslide in the north side of the range shown in green here whose um, sort of landslide base on the other side of the Whipple Fault appears to have been offset uh, by about four to five kilometers. So this is geological evidence that actually the Whipple Fault really was slipping at low angles um, close to the Earth's surface. There's also evidence from seismic reflection data of detachments or elytric low angle normal faults like this one in Nevada this fault has some very distinctive sedimentary layers abutted against it in the hanging wall. And yet those sedimentary layers are still essentially horizontal. And so this supports the idea that this fault has been slipping at low angles throughout its entire history. If it had started as a high angle structure and then was later tilted toward lower angles, then the sediments deposited against it should also have been tilted.
People have also looked at this problem from the point of view of thermochronology. This diagram on the left shows what happens to specific isotherms in the crust corresponding to the partial retention zones of different thermochronometers. The isotherms become worked upward within the foot wall of the detachment due to advection of heat. And so if you walk along the detachment in the slip direction, you should expect to encounter warmer and warmer geothermal uh, gradients or, or higher uh, temperature thermochronometers. You can then invert data collected in this way to infer fault slip. And this has been done for transects along detachments that are part of the Whipple detachment system. This is shown in the diagram on the right. And when you invert those thermochronometric profiles, you calculate detachment fault dips, again, that range from about 15 to 30 degrees. So um, supporting the idea of shallow fault slip. So if we assume that low angle normal faults really do exist, then we pretty much have to infer that they are simply not following Byerly's law, and instead they must be occupied by frictionally weaker minerals. These plots show how potentially weak minerals like certain phyllosilicates, for example, can affect the fault dip uh, that can be activated in a normal faulting regime. So the y-axis is showing the stress ratio. So you can think of it as just the ratio of sigma one to sigma three, both corrected by the fluid pressures. And then the upper x-axis shows the normal fault dip that could be activated for a given material. The plot on the left is for dry materials. The plot on the right is for wet. And the minerals or rocks that are shown here include granite, uh, the red curves, this is the reference material that conforms to Byerly's law with a high friction coefficient. And you can see that this is pretty much insensitive to wet or dry conditions. And no matter what, cannot activate slip on faults less than 40 degrees. Then if you examine a material like chlorite, uh, the green curves, you can see that it's quite strong under dry conditions, but becomes very weak uh, for wet conditions, weak enough that it could potentially explain uh, fault slip at 20 degrees, something like what we see on the Whipple detachment, which is observably uh, chloride rich. And then even weaker minerals, uh, clay minerals, elided smectite and also talc, they're very weak and they could also explain uh, slip on these structures. So it's possible that these more exotic rock and mineral types show up on low angle detachments and help explain their ability to slip at these low angles, but more work needs to be done to really test this uh, globally. So from here, our last video segment will step up in scale and focus on the driving mechanisms for large scale continental extension.